Okay, good morning class, right? So today, okay, we continue, okay, our discussion for paper, uh, for PT3 uh, model paper, okay, for science. All right, so number four, okay, so there are two types of reproduction, okay, so the name is sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. So sexual reproduction implants involve pollination and fertilization. So before we answer this question, so we do a little revision, okay. Alright, so the structure of function of each part of a flower, okay. So this is the part of the flower, okay. So this is the stamen, okay. So this is a male reproductive organ. So stamen consists of, consists of enter and element, okay. So this is a petal, okay, usually colorful to attract insects and animal. You need the sepal, okay, usually green in color and it protects the flower during the bud stage, okay. And inside of the sepal, okay, inside of this thing, this is over, uh, this is ovary, okay, this is the ovary, the yellow tea is called as ovary. And inside the ovary, they got the ovule here, okay. And then uh, this is called as a stigma, okay, this is because of the style, okay, and this tree, the stigma, style, and ovary, okay, is called as a pistil. So, pistil is the female, uh, female reproductive organ. This stamen is the uh, male reproductive uh, organ, okay, for the plants, okay. Alright, so the next one, okay, so the next one is the pollination. So, there are two types of flower, okay, the bisexual and unisexual, okay. So bisexual means they have a both, right? Uh, female and uh, male uh, structure of reproduction, okay? And if the unisexual means uh, they only uh, the female and they only got the male or female uh, reproduction, okay? So this uh, there are two types of flowers, bisexual and unisexual flowers. So most flowers are bisexual. Because they have both male stamen and female pistil, okay, reproductive organ in the same flower, okay. And unisexual flower are incomplete because they only have stamen or pistil, okay, whether they got the main reproductive uh, system or female reproductive system. But usually flower they got both, right, male and female, okay. So this is the example for the unisexual uh, flower, okay, unisexual flower. Okay, so stamen, okay, enter and filament, okay, and this is the petal, okay, and the, for the female flower, okay, they got the stigma, okay, they got the style here, ovary, okay, ovule, okay, and also the sepal here, and this is called as a pistil, okay, so this is called as a pistil. Okay, for the bisexual, okay, so stamen, okay, stamen consists of enter and filament, okay, so this is called as sepal here. And this is a stigma style ovary. Inside the ovary, they got the ovule. Okay, so this three stigma style and ovary is actually the female reproductive system that we call it as a pistil. Okay, so if like this means they got both, right? They got both female and uh, male reproductive organ. So this one is called as a bisexual. Okay, so you have to know the part of the flower here. Okay, next one. Okay, so this is the example okay, of the unisexual flower. Okay, papaya plants, okay, and the corn plants. Okay, so this is the male flower, this is the female flower. Okay, and this is a corn plant, is a male flower, and this is the female flower. Okay, all right. So next, uh, we see about the pollination, okay? So the, what is the pollination? So pollination is the process of transferring matured pollen grain from another, uh, sorry, from enter to stigma, okay? So process of transferring, right, matured pollen grains from enter to stigma, okay? Okay? So the mature uh, enter will burst and spread the pollen grains and some pollen grain might fall on soil and some are brought by the pollinating agents. So pollinating agents can be uh, such as uh, insects, okay, 
right? So by pollinating edges to the stigma of a flower. So pollination is divided into two: self pollination or cross pollination. Okay, so pollination process of transferring matured pollen grains from another uh, from enter to stigma. Okay, so enter means the male reproductive uh, organ to uh, stigma is the uh, female reproductive organ. Okay. So, this is called as a pollination, right? So, it's a two types of pollination. So, self-pollination and cross-pollination, okay? So, the self-pollination means actually uh, the pollination occurs, okay, in only one plant here, okay? It occurs in the one plant here, but if cross-pollination means between two plants here, okay? So, then, uh, then we need the uh, transferring agent here. So, usually it's insect. Right, so they use a uh, insect okay to transfer the pollen to the another plants here. Okay, so the cell pollinate pollination. So polygrains are transferred to the stigma or another plants on the same plant. Okay, so the polygrains are transferred to the stigma of the same flower. Okay, so this is the example of the cell pollination. So it just transfer, let's say, uh, the pollen here okay so there's a pollen uh, on the flower here so it will transfer to stigma okay, okay so this is the stigma so the pollen grains will transfer here okay for cross pollination okay so polygrains are transferred to the stigma of another plants on different plants of the same species okay same type of plants okay but only different uh different uh flowers okay different Okay, all right. So another next slide. Okay, so the pollinating agents. Okay, so how the pollen grain from a plant get transferred from another stigma to, to a flower. Okay, so this is uh, figure 5.28 shows the transferring process carried out by the pollinating agents. Okay, so the first, number one, the pollen grains from another of flower A stick on the body of leg of the insect. So let's say there's a butterfly here. Okay, so when it goes to the um, to the enter here. So they got the pollen grain at the enter here. Okay, so the pollen grain will stick to the leg, okay, or body of the insect. Okay. Then when the butterfly it goes to the another another flower. Okay, so the pollen grain carried by the insect are transferred to the stigma of flower B. Okay, then when the butterfly flies, it goes to another uh, flower. So, it will stick the pollen grain, okay, on the stigma. Okay, so this is the pollinating agent. Okay, the example, so if they use a insect. Okay, so what animals and insects pollin uh, are pollinating agents that help in the transferring process? Okay, so we will see the next slide. So, what are the characteristics of the flowers that to determine the pollinating agent? Okay. So, number one is the animal or an insect. Okay. So, this is the example of the pollinating agent. So, animal and insect. So, pollen grain usually stick on the beak or body of the animal. Okay. This is a bird. Okay. So, when an insect plant, uh, lands on the flower to start its nectar, to start its nectar, okay. So, pollen grain will stick to its furry feet and body. Okay, and then the characteristic of the animal pollinated and insect pollinated. So, they must have a big and colorful flowers. Okay, they must have big and colorful petals. Okay, and have nectar and smell nice. And produce rough and sticky pollen grain. Okay, so this is to, for easy for the pollen to stick to the body uh, of the insect uh, of any or animals. So they have must have a rough and sticky pollen grain. So the example of the animal pollinated flowers and insect pollinated uh, flowers are durian, rambutan, papaya, okay, hibiscus, sunflower and rose. Okay, so this is the type of plants that use the animal pollinated flowers. So means they use the animal or insect to transfer their pollen grain okay, from, uh, from a flower to another flower. Okay. So the next one is the wind. Okay. So another agent uh, of pollen, uh, pollination okay, is the wind. 
So when light pollen grains are blown by the wind and reach the stigma of another flower. Okay, so light pollen grains are blown by the wind and reach just the stigma of another flower. So the characteristic of the wind pollinated flowers so must have a white or pale petals. Okay, because it doesn't need to attract the animals or insects. So they only can have a like have white or pale petals. Another one is a have a long and furry stigma. Okay. And then another one is to have a plenty of a small, smooth and light pollen grain. So light means uh, it's easy for the pollens to uh, fly away, okay? And the next one is to have a long filament and style, okay? So the example of the wind pollinated flowers are corn, grass and paddy, okay? So this is the second agent of the pollination. The first one is animal or insect. So this is, second one is a wind, okay? Alright, the next one is the advantages of cross-pollination. So, it's the advantage of the cross-pollination? So, the cross-pollination, you can combine the genetic materials, okay, from the two parents' plants of the same species. Okay, so they got the many advantages, okay. So, the first one, the advantage is the healthier plants which can adapt better to changes in the environment. So, they can produce the healthier plants. Okay, and then the second one is the new varieties of plants. Okay, and third one is a good quality seeds. And then what, okay, new plants that are more resistant to pests and disease. Okay, the example uh, for durian, right? So they got many types, right? D24, okay. So that one is actually uh, from the cross-pollination. So they can produce better, uh, better, uh, better fruits, right? Okay, so the next one is the fertilization process. So after the pollination, after the green give be, uh, after the pollen green being transferred, right, uh, from the stigma to the enter. So what will happen? So the fertilization process will occur. So the after the uh, pollination, the fertilization will occur. So the male gam uh, gamete, okay, carried by the pollen, fuses with the female gamete in the ovule, okay. So how does this process occur? So the figure 4.31 shows the process of fertilization. Okay, so for number one, okay, so the when pollen uh, grain falls onto the stigma here, okay, so the first one, the pollen grain falls into the stigma. So this one can be used by the weather, wind or uh, by insect or by the animal. Okay, so it's transferred to the stigma here. Okay, so number two, the pollen tube carrying male gam uh, gametes grows toward the ovary. So after the pollen grain transferred to the stigma here, it will grow downward. Okay, so it will go downward. Right? Okay, and then after it reach the ovary here, okay, so after the pollen, the pollen tube penetrates the ovule, the male gamete fuses with the female gamete. So this is called as the fertilization. So when you move downward, so uh, the tube here, we go to the ovary here, then we go to the ovule. So you know, this is the ovary. Okay, so inside the ovary, they got the ovule here. So the male gamete fuses with the female gametes here. So fertilization occurs. Okay, so that is how the fertilization occurs after the pollination. Okay. So the pollen grain falls into the stigma. So and then it will grow towards the pollen tube. We grow towards the ovary. Sorry, to the ovule here, inside here. Then the male gamete, okay, inside the pollen will fuse with the uh, ovule here. So the fertilization occur. So that's the process of fertilization. Okay, and then after the fertilization, okay, after the fertilization, Okay, the ovule grows inside the ovary, okay. So, it will grow inside the ovary and then develops into seeds, okay. Alright, so after the fertilization, after the, uh, after the male, okay, male fused with the female, okay, the fertilization occur, the ovule grows inside the ovary and then develop into seeds. So, the seed is made up of an embryo, uh, embryo okay. 
uh, wrapped into the seed coat of testa. Okay, so this is the seed, right? So the outer layer here is called as a testa. Okay, so this small here, okay, small dot here is called as a micropyl, and this whole here is called as a helium. So this is the front view. Okay, right. So the other part will a seed is made of an embryo wrapped in uh, wrapped into the seed coat or testa. So the other parts of the flower will wither or fall. Right. So seed are divided into two, which are monocotyledonous or dicotyledonous. Okay. So figure four point three and uh, four point three two, figure four point three three shows the structure of monocotyledonous and dicotyledonous. So this one is actually for dicotyledon, right? So dicotyledon. So this is the testa, micropyl, helium. So for the if you uh, cut it, okay. So this is the longitudinal section. So the outside layer is called as a testa. Okay, this is called as a plumul. Okay. This is called as a plumer, and this one is called as a radical. Okay, so inside here, this is a cotyledon. Okay, so this is for the cotyledon. So let's say for the monocotyledonous. Okay, so this is the front view. So they got the seed coat here, okay, and got the radical. So if you cut, you can see the cross section. Okay, this is the seed coat, the outer layer here. So inside it, it causes as endosperm. Okay. So inside the endosperm, so they are got the cotyledon, okay, okay, and then as you see the the brown dot here, very small one, okay. So this is called as a plumer, okay, and then the white one is called as a radical. So this is for monocotyledon, okay. So there's a process, okay, it's from the first the pollination, okay, the pollination when the pollen grain is transferred to the anther. Okay, so that is called a pollination okay, and then after that there will be a, okay, a tube, right? So a tube will uh, grow towards the uh, ovule there. Okay, then the fertilization will offer that. Okay, after the fertilization, so they will produce a seed. Okay, so the seed is actually divided into two types, monocotyledonous and decotyledonous. So for mono uh, for decotyledonous, okay. So this is the testa, microspil, and helium. The structure is different, okay. And this is testa, a plumal and radical, and inside it a cotyledon. So the plumal radical and cotyledon is actually we call it as an embryo, okay. And then for the monocotyledon, they don't got the testa, but you got the seed coat here, and also the radical here, okay. And then this is the structure, okay. So there are two different uh, types of uh, seed, okay? Right, so the function, okay? So what is the function, okay? The structure and the function of the seed. Okay, for the testa, it's actually to protect the seed. Okay, for the helium, is a place where the seed sticks to the fruit, okay? And the micropyl is the small hole to allow air and water to enter the seed. So it's the function of the microfeed and helium and also testa. So this tree is called as a embryo. Okay. So this tree is called as a embryo. So what is the function for this tree? Plumber, radical, and cotyledon. Okay. Testa is actually more for the protection. Okay. Uh, Microfeed is to the small hole to allow air and water. Okay. Helium place where the seed sticks to the fruit. Okay, so embryo, the plumer, so the, the plumer is actually the part of embryo which develops into the new shoot. Okay, so the plumer is actually the part that we grow, we grow as a shoot. Okay, but for the radical, the part of embryo we develops into the root. Okay, so plumer is, you will develop into shoot. Okay, and the radical will develop into root. Okay, so what is the function of a cotyledon or endosperm? Okay, so there's a store, okay, and provide foods for the seed, okay, before they can do the process of photosynthesis, okay. Mm -hmm. So how does the plants get uh, the food, so how does the seed, okay, can get the food is actually from the cotyledon, okay, before they can do the process of photosynthesis, right. So this is the germination of seed, right. So how does the shape of germination seed change in terms of 
growth of the radical and plumer. Okay, so the radical will become the root. Okay, plumer will become the shoot. Okay, so this is the during the germination, the testa burst. Okay, so the testa here will be burst. So this one, the testa function is to protect the seed, right? So it will burst. Okay, so when it burst, okay, and the radius radical starts to appear. Okay, so the radical will start to appear. Okay, so remember radical will start to appear. So this one will go, uh, will become the root here. Okay. So, and then during the generation, the testa burst and the radical start to appear and grow downward into the soil to form a root. Okay, so meanwhile, the plumule, okay, so the plumule will grow upward to form a new shoot. So, certain cotyledons are carried out by the soil, okay, and this is known as epigeal germination, okay. And there are also cotyledons that remain in the soil during the germination. So this one, the germination is known as hypogeal, okay, germination. Okay, some of the plants, okay, when they grow, uh, when they grow, you see this one, the plumule, uh, the radical goes downward for, uh, to form a shoot and plumule will go upward, okay. We have form a shoot, okay, radical to form a root, okay. So then we left the cotyledon okay inside the inside the soil so if the if the cotyledon are left inside the soil okay uh, this is called as the hypogea okay means the cotyledon is left inside the soil but some of it the cotyledon like this one okay and this one the cotyledon if move okay is carried out okay from the soil okay so this is called as epigeal. So uh, there are two types of germination of the corticotyledon, whether they remain in the soil or they can grow up. Okay, uh, can grow up and they can go from uh, go up from the soil here. They can grow up from the soil here. So if they grow up, so the cotyledon also go up. Okay, with the plants. So this is called as epigeal. If the cotyledon remains on the soil, it causes hypo. So this is the example of epigeal. So you can see the cotyledon also grows, okay, follows the plant here. Okay, but for this one, this is the hypogeal, okay. The cotyledon will be left, okay, inside the soil, okay. Uh, but same, the radical will, move, uh, will form a shoot, uh, sorry, will form a root. The plumule will form a uh, shoot here, okay. But only this one, the cotyledon left inside the soil, the soil, okay. And this is the same size, right? So, what is the condition required for the germination of seed? Okay, so the first one, okay, we, uh, they need water, okay, and also air, and also the suitable temperature, okay? Uh, so, means the suitable temperature, they cannot uh, be like, if you put the refrigerator in the refrigerator, Okay, so the germination of seed will not occur, okay, because they need a suitable temperature, usually in the room temperature, okay, uh, room temperature is okay, or if you put in the hot place, okay, too hot also, uh, the germination of seed will not occur, so usually in the room temperature is okay already, okay. Alright, so after we uh, explain already about the pollination, okay, for the fertilization, right, and then uh, germination of seed, okay. How does the plants are uh, being formed? Okay, and pollination got two types: self pollination, cross pollination. Okay, what is the agent of pollination? Okay, uh, water. Uh, sorry, air, and also insects or uh, insect or animal. Okay, what is the characteristic for uh, for the agent pollination? Let's say, for example, for the uh, insect or animal, so usually they got a colorful petals, they got a nectar, okay, and they smells nice, okay. But for the wind, okay, they say for the wind, okay, usually light, right? Uh, and then it doesn't need a uh, colorful petals, okay, maybe usually white or white, white petals, okay, or pale petals, okay. Um, and then the example, okay, so what is the structure, okay. The structure of the plants, okay. Uh, how does the plant fertilization occur? 
Okay, so um, already explained that. So let's see the first question here. Okay, so there are two types of reproduction, namely sexual uh, production and asexual. So sexual production in plants involve pollination and fertilization. So it's the transfer of mature pollen grains from the enter to stigma. So that one is called as a pollination. Okay, so in the plant reproduction process, uh, what is develop will develop into a seed, whether radical or ovule. So of course ovule, right? Yeah, the radical is actually form roots. Okay, after the germination of seed, okay, the radical will form a roots. Okay, the plumer will form a shoots. Okay, so that is the first question. Right, the next one, complete the tree map below to classify the plants given into their types of vegetative uh, reproduction. Okay. So some, the euphostems, right? So uh, leaves or roots. So this is the, they just need to fill the box with the type of plants here. So using the stems is a ginger, leaves is a bryophyllum, okay? And also root is a carrot or sweet potato. Okay, so this is the type of the vegetative reproduction. Okay, so we go to the next slide. Okay, so Mutu carries out an experiment to investigate the effect of heat on calcium carbonate as shown in diagram 3. Okay, so this one is a form 3 topic, I think, right? Uh, reactiv uh, reactivity of metals, okay? Alright, so before we answer this question, let's do some revision, okay? So minerals, right? So variety of minerals. So minerals are solid elements of compound. So we already learned before, element only consists of one type of atom. Compounds can be one or more type of atoms, okay, that combine. Okay, that combine chemically, okay? So minerals in the form of elements like gold and silver exist freely in the earth's crust, okay? Minimum, uh, sorry, mineral in the form of compounds like bauxite and galena consists of combination of few types of different elements, okay? Alright, so example of elements, so gold, okay, diamond, right, and also silver. I mean, they only got one type of, uh, one type of atom, okay, inside the um, elements here. So example of compounds, okay, should be bauxite, okay, cassiterite, okay, magnetite, so hematite, okay, malicate, okay, iron pyrite, right, galena, okay, calcosite, okay, limestone, marble, okay, clay and also mica. So this is the example of compounds. So means they got one or more, uh, one or more than one, okay, types of, uh, atom inside the compound here, right? Okay, so natural compound, so oxide, right? So mineral, so what's the example of it? It's about oxide, hematite, magnetite, and cassiterite. And the chemical name okay, for bioxide is aluminium oxide. So what is the element, uh, what is the element contained in the chemicals? So of course, aluminium oxide means oxygen, right? Hematite is an iron oxide. So, consists iron and oxygen. Magnetite is magnesium and oxy oxide. So, magnesium and oxygen. And tin oxide means tin and oxygen. Okay. So, how about the sulfide? Okay. Uh, galena, lead sulfide, okay, lead and sulfur. Iron pyrite is iron sulfide. So, iron and sulfur. Okay. Calcosite is a copper sulfide. So, uh, copper and sulfur. Blend is a zinc. Sulfide is zinc and Sulfur. So this is the mineral and the chemical name and what does the element consist in the compound here. Right, the next one is the carbon, uh, carbonate, a calcite and also magnesite. So calcium carbonate, the name is calcium carbonate. So calcium, carbon and oxygen. Usually the, if the names uh, ends with the A-T-E, okay, so A-T-E usually they got oxygen, <coughs> okay. So, magnesium carbonate, magnesium carbon and oxygen. Okay, clay, aluminium silicate. So, aluminium silicon and oxygen. Okay, potassium silicate. So, calcium silicon and oxygen. 
Okay. So the next one, the reactivity series of metal. Okay. So different metal have different reactivity to oxygen. So the more reactive metal react more vigorously with oxygen. So in vigorous uh, reaction, between more, more reactive metal such as potassium with oxygen, a bright flame is observed. Okay. In a less or vigorous reaction with less reactive materials such as ion with oxygen, only amber or slow color changes can be observed. So it's depend on the reactivity of the metals. Okay, so more reactive we produce more bright flame. Okay. Alright, so a reactivity series of metal is formed based on the reactivity of metal with oxygen. Okay, so this one you have to uh, remember. Okay, right, potassium, sodium, okay, uh, calcium, natrium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium, zinc, okay, uh, iron, tin, lead, copper, mercury, silver, gold. So this one you have to remember. Okay, so we go downward. Okay, uh, if you go like this from here to here, okay, the reactivity will be decreased. Okay. So in the reactive series of metal, carbon is located between aluminium and zinc. So aluminium and zinc, okay, so carbon is in the middle, okay, between the aluminium and zinc. Okay, while hydrogen, okay, is located between zinc and hydrogen. Okay, so you have to remember where's the carbon and where's the hydrogen, okay. And although carbon is a non elementary element, it is able to remove a less reactive metal such as zinc from zinc oxide. Okay, although the carbon is actually is a non metallic it's not metal, okay, this is not metal, but it can remove the less reactive material. So means this is carbon, they can move zinc, okay, iron, tin, lead, copper, mercury, silver and gold. Okay, they can move the uh, they can react, right? They can react the, uh, with the um, zinc, iron, tin, lead, copper, mercury, silver and gold. Although it is not metal. Okay, so example like the zinc oxide, if you mix with the carbon. So the zinc, the oxide, the carbon will be able, right, to combine with the oxide here. Oxide means oxygen, right? So the carbon will mix, uh, will be able to combine with the oxygen to become carbon dioxide. So this is called actually the reduction process. Okay, so zinc oxide plus carbon. So the carbon will combine with the zinc oxide and mm -hmm. become carbon dioxide. And we can only get zinc here. Okay, so let's say if I have a lead. Okay, a lead. Lead is actually the plumbum. Okay, plumbum oxide plus carbon, right? So the carbon will combine with the oxide from the plumbum form carbon dioxide, then I can get only plumbum here. So actually that's called as the reduction process. Okay, so the application of the reactive series of metal. Okay, so metals that are more reactive than carbon or are located higher than carbon. Okay, so located higher than carbon means aluminium, magnesium, calcium, sodium and potassium. Okay, uh, <coughs> are extracted by electrolysis. Okay, so these metals are extracted by passing an electric current through the molten ores. Okay, so aluminium, okay, oxide, aluminium oxide and we put the uh, electric current flows through it, you can get the aluminium and oxygen. Okay, and the next one is a metal which are less reactive than carbon, which are, which are positioned lower than the carbon. Okay, so such as a metal, uh, such as a plumbum, zinc, iron, okay, are extracted by heating the ores with the carbon, okay, hopefully a coke. Okay, so tin oxide plus uh, carbon, uh, we get the tin plus carbon, the oxide, this one, same like this one. Okay. Mm. Alright, so magnesium burn in oxygen. So let's say if you uh, react the metal with the oxygen, so what will happen? So this is the example, the magnesium burn in oxygen, you can see there's a very bright flame okay, produced here. So when the magnesium has a uh, high reactive, uh, it's a high reactive material. Okay, and if iron to expose to oxygen, you can see come rust here. Okay. Alright, the next one is the constructive, the constructive reactive uh, 
a uh, series of metal okay so this is the uh, metals okay Calium, natrium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium, zinc, ferrum, stannum, plumbum, cuprum, mercury. HG is the mercury, argentum, uh, and aurum. Okay. So you have to remember uh, the symbol, okay, and also the name of course. Right. So here, from to if you go to the right, okay, go to the right, the reactive is become increase. Okay. So let's see if you react the metal with oxygen. Okay. So when the metal produce, uh, metals produce metal oxide when heated in the oxygen gas. Okay, so this is the equation, right? So metal plus oxygen produce metal oxide. Okay, for example, aluminium plus oxygen produce aluminium oxide. So this is the arrangement, okay, of the apparatus for the experiment. So this is the potassium magnet crystal. This is the glass wool. This is the asbestos and you put the metal here. So let's say you put the aluminium here. Okay, and this is the glass wool also. Okay, so what's the function of the potassium magnet crystal here? So I think you already know this one is to provide the oxygen for the burning process. Okay, so when you heat the potassium magnet, you will release the oxygen. Okay, so the oxygen will mix with the metal here. So you can see we burn the metal here. So it will produce the... Um, burning process here okay so the glass was actually to separate right the potassium magnet and also the metal powder so the ration you have to remember uh, so the equation you have to remember okay, aluminium plus oxygen aluminium oxide if they say i use the plumber they say okay uh, plumber plus oxygen will become plumber oxide if i put a calcium, so calcium plus oxygen will become calcium oxide okay if I put the magnesium, magnesium plus oxygen will become magnesium oxide. Okay, so that is the equation. So this is the example, right? The next one is the determining, uh, determining the position of a carbon in the reactive series, okay? So we already know actually the carbon is, okay, situated between the aluminium and zinc. So how does we know that the carbon is actually, should be put between aluminium and zinc, okay? So that's this, uh, this is the experiment, okay. So this is a crucible, okay, this is a pipe clay triangle. So this is arrangement of the apparatus. So this is the mixture of the carbon and the metal oxide, okay. So this is called actually the reduction process, the one that I told you that if you want, uh, let's say zinc oxide plus carbon, you produce zinc and carbon dioxide, okay. So this is the uh, we use the reduction experiment, okay, the reduction experiment to prove that actually carbon is situated, <coughs> okay, carbon is situated between the aluminium and zinc. Okay, for this one, okay, this is the arrangement of apparatus. So, we put the, let's say we put the <coughs> aluminium here, we put the zinc here, okay, zinc, okay, zinc, Okay, you put the zinc oxide here, okay, and you heat the zinc oxide with the carbon. Okay, so it will uh it will produce the zinc plus carbon dioxide. So mean it can react, means it uh the carbon is uh the carbon is more reactive to uh zinc. Okay, okay, so this is the example of the experiment of the uh if you to, mean, to determine that the actually carbon is uh, with, uh, between zinc and the aluminium. Okay. And this is the experiment to determine the position of hydrogen. Okay, so this is dilute sulfuric acid plus copper sulfate solution. This is the zinc and okay. this is the hydrogen gas. Okay, so this is anhydrous calcium chloride. This is actually to absorb, right, uh, the moist, okay from the gas hydrogen, uh, for the hydrogen gas, okay, then the dry hydrogen gas will go to the, uh, here, okay, we go here, right, and then it will heat, okay, uh, this is the metal oxide. Can react means it more reactive, okay. Alright, the next one is the, um, 
is the uh, pro, uh, let's say they do the experiment so this is the result right so the hydrogen when we combine with the aluminium oxide the aluminium oxide does not glow okay so means the hydrogen does not reduce aluminium oxide so means the hydrogen is less reactive than aluminium because there, there is no reaction okay and then if uh, if you put hydrogen and zinc oxide okay, the zinc oxide does not glow means no reaction the zinc oxide turn yellow when hot and white on cooling okay so does not glow means the hydrogen does not reduce zinc oxide so means the zinc is actually uh, reacting then hydrogen okay and then hydrogen and iron oxide so you can see now there's a reaction here okay so when there's a reaction means the hydrogen is uh, is more reactive than iron okay and then the next one hydrogen and lead okay or plumber okay also you can see there's a reaction here means the hydrogen is more reactive to the lead okay and then hydrogen and copper so also have a reaction so means the hydrogen is high reactive than the copper so that's how we determine the actually the hydrogen is uh, between okay uh, zinc and uh, iron okay zinc and iron all right so after we do the we do the two experiment there okay so you can see here this is actually the reactive series of metal okay calcium natrium calcium uh, so the zinc carbon is L between aluminium and zinc hydrogen is between zinc and ferrum okay all right so extraction of metals with their ores. Okay, so extraction of metal is the process to obtain metals from their ores. Okay, so the first one is a process of iron extraction. Uh, is is uh, sorry extraction. So the extraction of iron from its ore is carried out in the blast furnace. Okay, so iron ore and the limestone and the coke. Okay, coke is actually a uh, carbon here. Okay, so we add. So the three elements okay, in uh, the three compound here inside here okay, in the blast furnace here okay and then the reaction will occur okay so the molten iron we go here and this is a slug here this is uh, usually the slug is used to as the base or foundation of the road uh, okay all right so the blast furnace the process okay so Okay, the coke reacts with the oxygen to give carbon dioxide. Okay, this to produce the carbon dioxide. So the carbon plus oxygen, okay, produce carbon dioxide. Okay, and then the carbon dioxide, okay, we react uh, unreacted coke uh, to give a carbon monoxide. Okay, carbon monoxide. So the high at high temperatures, iron core is reduced by carbon. So produce the, this carbon here that will produce. Okay, the carbon here that we produce will reduce the uh, the ferrum, okay, the ferrum oxide, okay, to, okay, to get only ferrum and carbon monoxide here. So that is the function of carbon. So the carbon is usually reduce the ferrum oxide, okay, uh, to produce the ferrum and carbon monoxide, right? Okay, and then the carbon monoxide react with the iron oxide in the redox reaction to give a poor ion. Okay, the carbon monoxide here, you will react again with the ferrum oxide okay, to produce a, a poor ion here, a poor ferrum here and also carbon dioxide. Okay, so this is actually the process inside the glass furnace. Okay, so this one the molten iron, okay, because its the density is higher, so we go to the uh, here, right, and this one molten slab, okay. This one is the less than we go here. So this one is foundation of group of building. So this is the molten slab. Okay. So this is the process. Okay. The step one, carbon react with the oxygen, produce carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide react, react with the more carbon to produce the carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide reduce the ion oxide to make a molten liquid ion. Okay. And the limestone and calcium carbonate, right? react with the impurities such as silicons to form an easy to collect waste coal slug okay so this is the reaction okay, and then the liquid slug is run off the bottom and is used as a building material in the road construction okay all 
Alright, so mining issues in Malaysia. So there are many, uh, this is the issue okay, of the mine, for the mining in Malaysia. So usage of large amount of electrical energy. So it can produce the air pollution by gases released from the blast furnace. Okay, and also destruction of habitat due to the construction of mines. Okay, some pollution. Okay, soil eruption due to mining of ore and water pollution due to cleaning of ore. Okay, and also air pollution due to burning of fuels. Okay, so this is mining issues in Malaysia. Okay. Alright, so let's answer the question here. Alright, so. Okay, based on diagram 3, we underline the correct answer for following statement. Okay, so this is the calcium carbonate, right? Calcium carbonate being heated, okay? So what's the uh, product, okay, for this experiment? So if the calcium carbonate being heated, they will produce the carbon dioxide, okay? So liquid M is a, so what's the liquid, right? The, how does we test uh, the carbon dioxide? So we use a lime water, okay? So lime water. So the lime water will become cloudy, right? After uh, carbon dioxide mixed with the lime water, it will become cloudy. And the next one is a marble is the type of calcium carbonate, okay? Marble is the type of calcium carbonate. Okay, so complete the word equation by using the following words, okay? So calcium carbonate, when heated, it will become the Calcium oxide and also carbon dioxide. Okay, calcium or carbonate when heated, right? Produce a calcium oxide and also carbon dioxide. Okay, so this is the answer for question number five. Okay, so let's move on to another question. Okay. So let's see the question first. Okay, so diagram 1.1, right, shows the type of cell found in the human body. Okay, so what is the type of the cell here? Name the type of cell. So that one is actually white blood cell. Okay, so let's see the, uh, we do a written revision, right? Okay, specific body defense mechanism, right? So the body, uh, and then the second one is a non-specific body defense mechanism, okay? So let's see the first. So how does our body, okay, defense, okay, from the pathogen or virus, okay? So the first line of the defense for our body is from the skin, okay? So the skin, okay, so the skin, they prevent the pathogens from entering the body, okay? So, this is our first line defense. Okay, however, right, if there's too, the, there's too small, okay, okay, maybe the pathogens is too small, it okay, can penetrate to our skin, okay, so the pathogen that successfully get passed from the first line of defense, enter the bloodstream, okay, and face the second line of defense, okay. So, the second line of defense is actually from the white blood cell, okay. So the white blood cell, okay, they fight pathogens through phagocytosis. It means uh, in the like uh, very easy terms to understand is actually the white blood cell, okay, they eat the pathogen here. Okay, during uh, the process we call it as a phagocytosis, okay. And they see the pathogen are succeed passing through the second line defense. So there will face the third line defense, okay, so the fight pathogens, uh, the fight pathogens by produce, uh, producing the antibodies, okay, so the antibody attach the, uh, to the pathogen, okay, so this is to prevent the pathogens from entering a host call, uh, and then the antibody cause pathogen to clump together, okay, so it will attach like this. So this is the antibody, okay? So they are clumped together, stick together like this, okay? So they cannot move to the uh, to the host call here, okay? So the first line is from the skin. If they manage to get, so the white blood cell will, uh, will fight with the pathogen, okay, through the phagocytosis. Means they eat the 
uh, virus or pathogens here. If they succeed, then the antibody will be released okay, from our body and the antibody will crumb like this, the pathogen from entering the host cell. So this is the third line defense of our body. Okay, so the next one. <coughs> okay, so this one. All right, uh, the first line defense is the skin. So the human skin is made of tough layer. It's difficult to penetrate by microorganism. Okay, microorganism can only get into the body if there's a wound or if the skin is injured, right? And the sweat and the sebum created by the skin contain chemicals that kill, can kill for microorganism. So this is the skin, the first line defense, okay? All right, and then the second one is a mucous membrane, all right? So the mucous membrane is a membrane that line of digestive tract or respiratory tract. So the respiratory tract is actually like your nose, okay? So you can see there's a moist inside your nose, right? So they actually the mucous membrane, uh, membrane. So that one is also uh, a defense, okay? So prevent the microorganism to enter our body. So microorganisms that enter the respiratory tract are filtered by nasal hair, right? And trapped by the mucus lining the nasal cavity. So this is actually from our respiratory system. Okay, and then the earwax, tears and vaginal secretion also function as an antiseptic that kill organisms. So the ear earwax also function Okay, to prevent the microorganism okay, from entering our body. So, the first line of defense is skin and mucous membrane. Okay, for the second line of defense, so this is what I say, phagocytosis. So, phagocytosis, the white blood cell engulf and digest. Okay, and digest the pathogen using the enzyme through phagocytosis. So, this is the white blood cell. This is the pathogen, uh, sorry, pathogen. So, they will eat the pathogen here and digest the pathogen. So this is called as a phagocytosis. So let's say the, uh, the microorganism, right, can guide, can pass through the second line of the second line of defense. So our body immune system, okay, they will produce the antibody. Okay, so what is the immunity? Immunity. So immunity is the ability of the body system to resist pathogen before it is infected. Okay. And it's involved the production of antibody, right? When pathogen enter the body. Okay, so what is the antibody? Antibody is a protein produced by white blood cell. So this one is actually the important. This is the important of the white blood cell. Okay, they produce the antibody. Okay, uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to prevent, right, the microorganism, okay, from entering the bloodstream. Okay, so antibody is a protein produced by what blood cell into bloodstream in response to antigens. So what is the antigen? So antigen is a foreign substance that come from outside the body and reduce the, uh, and induce the production of antibodies. So antigen is such as a, uh, um, uh, microorganisms that is called as the antigen. So example of antigen are pathogen, okay, toxic mercury and blood cell from other blood group. Okay, so this is the third line of defense. Okay, you have to remember what's the meaning of immunity, okay, what's the antibodies, okay, who produce the white blood cell. So let's say uh, you ever, maybe you ever heard the uh, uh, disease called as um, uh, leukemia or cancer, blood cancer. So blood cancer is actually when the uh, white blood cell okay, is higher than the red blood cell. So what is the, if the white blood cell is too high also it's not good, okay? Because you know the white blood cell is actually they will eat the pathogen, okay, or the micro, the pathogen that enter our body system, right? So let's say if there's no pathogen, so what is the white, white blood cell will do? Because there's so many blood cell, white blood cell there, so they will eat the red blood cell. Okay, then the red blood cell will reduce. So that's caused the cancer, uh, the blood cancer. Because the count of the uh, white blood cell is higher than red blood cell. So because they have nothing to do, so they will eat the red blood cell. The red blood cell will reduce. Okay, the count of the red blood cell will reduce. Okay. Alright. Uh, I think uh, maybe we answer first. And this one I will continue uh, on Friday.
Okay, we will continue it on Friday. So let's answer the question first. I think this one we can answer. Okay, name the type of type blood, name the type of cell in diagram 1.1. So this is called as white blood cell. So what is the function carried out by this type of cell? So this one is actually for our body system for defense, right? So they produce antibodies and carries out phagocytosis to kill pathogen. Okay, so that is the function of the white blood cell. It's uh, for our defense, okay, our body defense system. Okay, so it has to can uh, kill the pathogens by eating the pathogens and that one is called as a phagocytosis process or they can produce the antibodies with the protein okay um, to clump all the pathogens okay, like the diagram I show below okay so this is the okay, function of the uh, white blood cell Okay, so I think I stop first until here. Okay, we continue with the immunity. Okay, about the immunity system in our body. Okay, uh, on Friday, right? On Friday. Okay, so thank you class.